and everyone and happy Sabbath. It is such a privilege to be here again. You know, um, these training opportunities are really awesome. And I know you've been learning a whole lot. So we are here again, another Sabbath time to look at what we call the true cause of disease. Now I know it's an interesting topic and it's not that I know more than anybody else, but let's see how we could examine some, some stuff this evening and establish what we call cause, because a lot of times what is being done is looking at the effect. Now, the effect is the result. The cause is what is determining what is happening. And so if we misunderstand cause, we run the risk of miss, in missing the intervention that is actually needed. So let's close our eyes and bow our heads as we pray. Father, we are thankful that you love us with that everlasting love that only you can give. And you're calling us to cooperate with you. We ask for the Holy Spirit to open our minds, to receive from you, to learn from you, and to give back to you glory and honor and praise. Be with everyone on the platform. And even though there are some who may not be here yet, bring them quickly. May someone send out a reminder so that they can join and hear the word of God this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you again for coming. Gospel Medical Missionary Training 2021. This is really an opportunity, I tell you. It's awesome, you know, to be welcome to trainings like these because you, you are able to be exposed to a lot of things that ordinarily we would not be exposed to. And so God's desire for us, according to 3 John 2, is that we prosper and be in health. You see, sickness is not God's design. Sickness is of the enemy. Even though God would have said certain things about sickness, he was more describing the end as opposed to prescribing it. Because God knows everything, the natural result of disobedience to God's law would be disease. But God's desire is that we prosper and be in hell. James chapter 1 tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of what? Light, with whom is no variableness, nor shadow of turning. No bending, no parallax, no possibility of bending. I, I tell you, we serve a marvelous God. Now in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, listen to this. So because God loves us so much, according as his divine power had given us all things. What does all mean? All mean all things that pertain to one life and godliness. Life and godliness. How? Through a knowledge of him that call us according to his glory and virtue. Through that knowledge, you know, it is important for us to understand that God is the giver of life not of death. Death comes when we separate from the source of life. That's why you have death. And the separation from the source of life is either through ignorance. Um, sometimes that happens through ignorance, disobedience. That's why that happens. But here is God's ideal in the beginning. When God created us as human beings, he created Adam and Eve. In the beginning, he made man in his image. So the image of God cannot be to die or to get sick. Um, man was perfect, genetically perfect, mentally perfect, spiritually perfect, and the human being possessed pure conscience and noble reason. We will see why that is important. Pure conscience, pure conscience being able to hear the voice of God and to respond. Noble reason, remember we always say reason is the ability to evaluate evidence and come to a conclusion. It is to think to meditate and to understand, to reason. So he had perfect, you know, pure conscience and noble reason. And he experienced what we call perfect worship in a face-to-face -face relationship with God. Perfect worship, it is by beholding that we become changed. So to be changed, to continue in God's image, to grow, we must spend time with God. And when man was created, that is how he was created. But man was also created with the power of choice. So in that face-to-face -face relationship with God, um, all his faculties would be kept in harmony. 
The principle of love and liberty would govern his mind. Peace and contentment would be the outgrowth of a mind in perfect balance. What a mind that is. You know, we look around today and we are not seeing those kinds of things. So today, everything has changed. Life is a threat. A threat from everywhere, you know, viruses, bacteria, parasites, toxins, you name it. Life is a threat. We are living under the threat, but God has made every provision. Remember we said, if you go back to the slide, his divine power had given us what? Everything we need for life and godliness. Now, many people look at that text and they only think about the godliness part. To be godly, you need to, be, to have life. As a matter of fact, I will go back to that um, quote from Education 99, to transgress his law, physical, mental, or moral, puts one out of harmony with the universe and invite discord, anarchy, and ruin. What God is trying to say is that every aspect of his law is important. The physical laws are important, the mental laws are important, and the moral law is important. Most people are trying to be godly while neglecting physical and mental laws. So the physical laws are the laws that are given for life and the mental laws. And the moral law is given for godliness. It says, and that happens through a knowledge of him to a knowledge of God, his character, his methods, his design that called us to what? To glory. Glory is to reveal the character of God in my own and in your own and to make him known. His character of love, selfless, other-centered love, which is to give of oneself for the building up of others, expecting nothing in return. Virtue actually is moral excellence and that those are attributes of God, All right? So now we have a threat because of sin. Sin came in and everything actually changed. But God's design did not change. You see, God is changeless. He doesn't move. I am the one that moves. You are the one that moves, not God. He doesn't move. He is constant. That's why he could say, I send the rain on the just and the unjust. He sends the sunshine on everybody. He sends the air for everybody to breathe. God's love does not discriminate. All the plants, the heathen, the atheist, the Christian, all those plants are going to receive the material for photosynthesis. God wants us to take a picture and see how love works. Disease actually is when we go out of harmony with God's ideal. So we are three-dimensional. We are body, soul, and spirit. The body is simply the tool for our minds and spirit to express themselves in the physical world. Um, soma, numa, psyche, we call that. The soma is the physical body. The psyche are the thoughts and the feelings. And the numa is the power source, the breath of life. That's how we are designed. So we have thoughts and feelings. They are coexistent and co-equal. I will always be making that point because as we understand these things better, causal relationships are going to become much clearer. How would you not want to look like a nice strong lion, the king of wild beasts, noble and regal. I tell you, I mean, some people would envy how this lion looks, but this can happen if we follow God's divine ideal. What about an ox? And all these are expressing aspects of the character of God, strong, patient, and toiling continually, even without reward sometimes. Or an eagle, having sight, being able to look directly into the sun, um, you know, soaring so high, or like the man Christ Jesus, the king of creation. And so we can have those if we truly spend time with God. But there is an enemy. And he understands aspects of our character, aspects of our physiology that we should understand that we actually don't. So in Councils to the Church, page 101, it says the brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are the only medium, underline that word in your mind, only medium through which heaven can communicate with humans and affect their inmost life. Now, if this is true, what would the enemy try to do? Not short circuit that um, communication. So he's going to short circuit the communication by getting us to deviate from God's design for life. For the only way to life is through God's ideal. So now, whatever disturbs the circulation of the electric current in the nervous system, here's what it does. It lessens the strength of the vital power. That is where you call sickness entering in, in the physical body and thus affecting the mind and hence the communication between heaven and humans. What the enemy wants to do is to intercept that communication 
so that we will be ill, we'll be sick. Sick people are not rational. Let me say that again. Sick people are not rational because in your pain, your distress, your discomfort, you find it difficult to have faith. Now, the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, with faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. When one is sick, it is difficult to hear the word of God because you are thinking about your pain. You are thinking about your distress. You are thinking about your discomfort. And so the result, the result of the intercept, um, short-circuiting that electric current that goes to the brain, it says it lessens the strength of the vital powers. What are the vital powers? The power to reason, which happens in the mind, the thoughts and the feelings. And the result is a deadening of the sensibilities of the mind. Now, if the mind's sensibilities are deadened, then we are going to live by our passion. And our, our, our passion, our affection, we are going to live by desire. When we live by desire, that is the natural way to get sick. There will be no breaks on. So disease never comes without a cause. And Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2, last part tells us that the curse causeless shall not come. There is always a cause and the effect always follow the cause and the, cause, the effect must never be blamed as the cause. So we always know that not without a cause, disease always comes. Therefore, what is disease then? Now, there's a spiritual definition. Now, the world has a way of defining disease, but God is going to tell us from his word what disease really is. Disease, according to Ministry of Healing 127, is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. Now, think about it carefully. Remember we said to transgress his law, physical, mental, or moral is going to put one out of harmony with the universe. All of the universe is made up of solid, liquid, and gas, and all of the universe is governed by law. Physical law, you and I are made up of solid, liquid, and gas, therefore you and I are governed by law. But what makes us akin to God is the fact that we are not only governed by physical law, we are governed by a moral law. And so that moral law is just as important, not superior to the mental laws and the physical laws, but it gives us the capacity to communicate with God and to understand God different from the other aspects of creation. When we violate the law, nature is going to respond with what we call disease, which really is her effort to help us. Disease is not, disease is not the enemy, disease is our friend. So the next line of that quotation says, in case of sickness, first the cause must be ascertained. And we wanna look at that tonight, the root cause. Unhealthful conditions changed, wrong habits corrected. Then nature is to be assisted in an effort to expel impurities. The expulsion of impurities is what is normally called disease. But if nature is trying to expel impurities, then disease cannot be the enemy. Disease is the body speaking to us that something is going wrong and to establish right conditions in the system, what I like to call balance, homeostasis. So now God designed the body to be in homeostasis, but because of our ignorance of God's law, his design, his protocol, we experience sickness. Why? Because we have moved away from that perfect communion with God, that worship, because that's what worship is, that which, which I ascribe value to, that which is important to me, that which I admire, I am going to spend my time and my resources with. So when people think, oh, I love God, and they spend no time with him, you know, then we have a problem there. Now, um, God is going to give us some things in the body. And I'm establishing this because as we set the foundation, we have internally the fact that the, through the vagus nerve, all our enteric organs are communicating with the brain. Remember we said the brain nerves are the only channel through which heaven can communicate with humans and affect their inmost life. So now we are going to understand now how we are having now another set of communication. So the brain nerves is actually fed a lot through 
the vagus nerve in the enteric system. The, in, the, through the vagus nerve, there's more communication going from the brain, from the gut, sorry, to the brain. That is important for us to understand because it is through the gut that we have digestion. Digestion is the parallel to comprehension or understanding. So what is happening is here is that we are going to consume food that is supposed to be by God's design because as the designer of the body, he is the one who knows the best fuel. He has already given that to us in Genesis chapter one. Now, the fuel that God has given is going to be consumed through the digestive system and be broken down, assimilated, and is now going to nourish every organ, including the brain, which has the nerves that communicate with heaven. Therefore, anything that affects that current is going to affect the way we think and also the way we feel. The body and the mind and the spirit are all connected. They are co-equal and co-existent. So God has given us a wonderful system. He has given us the immune system to help us, you know? But why are we still getting sick? Well, we have an immune system and there are even two parts to the immune system. We have the innate immune system and we have the adaptive immune system, that specific immune system and that non-specific immune system, that which we are born with, our skin and our mucous membranes and our saliva and our tears and the secretions of our body form part of what we call the innate immune system. And then we have the adaptive immune system that adapts to specific um, threats from the body. You know, specific threats that may come in, they are able to mount a response. You see, his divine power has given us what? Everything we need that pertains to life. When we think about that, what wondrous love is this? Oh, my soul, we can sing. We can be in awe of God because God has given us that which we need. But if the body doesn't get the tools that it requires, it will cause a breaking down in these physical systems and hence disease is going to occur. So truly health and disease depends on who? On my choice and on your choice. So normally one of the reasons that we have a lot of people continuing in sickness is because of the approaches that are normally used. These approaches sometimes could determine whether a person um, remain ill or not. Now, from an epidemiological perspective, um, we learn what we call what cause is. And just a, a loose definition, um, a factor is the cause of an outcome. If the operation of that causal factor increases the frequency of the outcome. So now, if you, what is, that is saying is, if you have some conditions operating, whether physical or chemical or otherwise, they usually will give a particular outcome. That's similar to the law of cause and effect. But the definition doesn't stop there. It says there are different types of cause. You have what we call necessary cause. You have sufficient cause. You have both necessary and sufficient. And then you have neither necessary nor sufficient. Now, what would be, let's say, uh, a necessary cause? It means that something has to be present for you to get a particular outcome. So for example, um, if you have to get Ebola infection, you need the Ebola organism is necessary. So if it is necessary, then it has to be present. What about sufficient? Well, sufficient means that while it can be present, there are other situations that are needed to cause disease. And then of course you have both necessary and sufficient. So for example, its presence alone would cause one to get ill. It doesn't matter your immune system. It doesn't matter what is happening. And then of course, neither necessary nor sufficient means that you can get a particular illness even though you have no other conditions. For example, you don't have to smoke to get lung cancer. So smoking is neither necessary nor sufficient. Um, if you're looking at, let us say we use the coronavirus, coronavirus is necessary to get COVID, but it's not sufficient because everybody don't get it. So that's how you apply those types of definitions. So if you have to look at the big picture, now, why do people get sick? We have unresolved emotional trauma, nutritional deficiencies, uh, toxic overload and physical trauma. Those are the main cause of disease. So now if we look at, let's say 
unresolved emotional trauma, um, emotional abuse, negative thoughts, buried emotions. Many people have these, especially Christians. We are sometimes cultured to suppress, to behave, to get the favor of God. And my friends this evening, these things do not give us better health. A lot of reasons why we are not living dynamic Christian lives is because a lot of Christians have emotional problems, negative thoughts, and buried emotions. Remember, feelings buried alive never die. And I wish we could go into that a little bit more in terms of the emotional health, but maybe another time. Maybe next week we'll do some emotional health. Then, of course, nutritional um, deficiencies. Why? Poor diet actually sometimes has a lot of connection to the negative thoughts. Um, the culture and, and our education determines how we eat. Uh, most of us, when we went to school, we learned in nutrition about that pyramid, which science is now saying it's no good, that we need carbohydrate for energy and that some foods don't have this and some foods don't have that. Science is now showing us that it is different and they have actually changed that pyramid. So we have grown up accepting a lot of things that were not very true. And today we are experiencing sickness. Um, coming up, as being um, the products of slavery, what we find is that the slavery diet focused a lot on carbohydrates because you needed energy to work all day. Now, we don't work all day. We are sitting in our offices or we are doing some sedentary thing, but we're still eating like slaves. Dehydration. With the Industrial Revolution, water doesn't is not tasting good anymore. People are using a lot of what we call refined sugars, a lot of high concentration. The, the, the World Health Organization recommends six teaspoons of sugar per day for the average adult. That's about 25 grams. In one 250 ml of uh, juice is about six teaspoons. If you drink a small or a malter, that's about 30 something teaspoons. So we are, we are exceeding to a great extent in terms of that. Uh, then, of course, the demand, we become dehydrated because that high sugar load is going to dry out a lot of the cells and stuff. But instead of drinking water, when we're thirsty, we drink more juice. Um, toxic overload from poor elimination and environmental toxins. And so because we are not giving the body the right tools, the liver has to overwork. And if the liver has to overwork, then the kidneys have to overwork and the system is going to be damaged. And of course, physical trauma, um, exposure to varying thing, in injuries, sleep deprivation and the like. So when we look at the root cause of disease, I, I like this poem, you know, um, Samuel Thomas, Thompson, sorry. He says, let names of all disorders be, like to the limbs joined to the tree. Work on the root and that's of you and all the limbs will bow to you. The limbs are colic pleurisy, worms and gravel, gout and stone. Remove the cause and the, then it's gone, you know, remove the cause and they are all what gone. So we're going to lighten disease in terms of a tree today. And we're going to look at the various aspects of a tree. All trees have to grow in some kind of soil, some kind of medium. The problem with most of us is that we have what we call lines of weakness in our bodies. And you may have heard me refer to those lines of weakness in terms of digestion. Um, a lot of folks have what we call hydrochloric acid deficiency. And hydrochloric acid deficiency is primarily due to deficiency in calcium. Calcium is the king of nutrients, and it is when calcium gets into the cell that the other nutrients get into the cell. If calcium doesn't get in, then the other nutrients don't get in. But to get calcium, we have to get it in the diet. The best source of dietary calcium is your green leafy vegetables and the like. These are the best sources. God designed them that way. If you even want to get more technical, you want to get more fancy. The structure of calcium, you know, every mineral has a structure is four square just like the new jerusalem so god is putting even in science his character when you look at calcium structure and you look at the new jerusalem it's the same structure you know isn't that a beautiful picture that to to, to get into the new jerusalem we have to have the character of christ for all the nutrients to get into the cell where life happens they jump on the back of calcium but that doesn't happen except what if glucose is not getting into the cell, then calcium doesn't get into the cell and so on. So a lot of people have this deficiency um, with calcium. Calcium is necessary for the chief cells in the stomach to liberate their hydrochloric acid. Of course, we're talking about high hernias, especially for people 
um, who, who, who have poor eating habits and so on, usually people who are slim and tall tend to have this problem where the, um, that the head of the stomach, as it will, pushes back up into the esophagus. Um, Iliocecal valve, a lot of clogging there, down in the colon side because a lack of fiber and so on. Then you have liver problems, kidney problems. And then of course you have the pituitary and the thyroid and the adrenal. They are working together to determine metabolism and operations of cells and liberation of hormones and so on. Those things are really off for most people. And many parents are bequitting these lines of weakness to their children. And so become more susceptible to infections and to colds and flus and disease and viruses and germs and bacteria. And so let's look in terms of the cause. Every tree is in a soil, you are in the soil as well. So um, the first thing we're gonna look at the, is, is the physical and emotional makeup. That's like the soil in which um, the tree lives. So your physical and emotional makeup is very important in dealing with disease. So a person who has what we call a strong constitution, they will be able to handle more stress than a person with a weaker constitution. So under the same physical conditions, one person may thrive while another person may take ill. So we cannot have a broad brush to paint everybody. We have different kinds of structures. We have people who are hot, people are cold, people are dry, people are moist. All these things must be taken into consideration. Some people have a stronger constitution than others. That's the physical and emotional makeup. So, yes, then um, every tree has roots and the roots are in the soil. So remember the soil is the emotional and physical makeup. Some people are simply made up better than some. That is the result of sin. Which is why we have to be careful, um, and I, I encourage you to read chapter 54 of the book Patriarchs and Prophets. It's very instructive as to how women should take care of themselves before they have babies. And um, science is proving that chapter to be very right. I'll just share a little part from it. It says, a lot of children born blind, deaf, and imbecile is the result of the mother poor nutrition while she was pregnant and before. So you we shouldn't just be entering into these things just for so, you know, people go for pleasure and babies come and then we have an, a, 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 a whole corner cookie of, of people who are ill. And that puts a strain because now when people are stressed, they cannot take care of themselves nor their progeny and we have a problem. So as we said, all trees are in a soil and the part that is in the soil are the roots. So the root cause of disease are the environmental stresses that overwhelm the body, the ability of the body to maintain balance. So listen to this. So the root cause is what? Those are the environmental stresses that overwhelm the ability of the physical body to maintain balance. Remember, balance is homeostasis and that requires some, some things. You have to have good constitution and a good um, system to handle that. So now we talk about trauma. And we said that trauma are those physical things that affect the body. We talk about toxicity and poisons, very important. We talk about nutritional deficiencies and we talk about mental and emotional stress. People, we all go through these and our success or failure is going to be determined by our body's ability to adapt to the change. Now, all cells require some things. They live in a fluid medium and they require nutrients, oxygen, and waste removal. Now, we have what we call the biological terrain, which is the environment, the internal environment in which the cells live. The cells live in this fluid environment that is called the biological terrain, or we call that lymphatic fluid. The root cause of disease is going to upset the biological terrain. That is the environment in which the cells live. So either physical trauma, toxicity, nutritional deficiency, or emotional um, uh, um, stress, they are going to what? Upset the biological terrain. And this is the biological terrain that supports and is regulated by the systems of the body. What are the systems of the body? The digestive system and the respiratory system. So we're talking here about the root cause. Remember, let's follow carefully. The root cause of disease is going to upset the biological terrain. What is the biological terrain? It is the environment in which the cells live. 
It is the cells that make up tissues, make up organs, make up systems, and hence the organism, you and me, who have the brain nerves which, through which heaven communicates with humans and affect their inmost being. Remember, the enemy understands these things. So he's going to manipulate us at a level that we may be ignorant so that he can have success because he knows if we understand and practice these things, then his power is going to be broken. It's a battle for the mind. How do we know that? Well, Ephesians chapter six says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he gives the antidote. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses three says, verse three to five says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The next verse is key. It says, casting down imaginations, or in other words, is arguments that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What are those thoughts? Those thoughts are what, are what we call the, the, how heaven communicates with humans and affect the inmost beings. For if the thoughts are wrong, the feelings are going to be wrong. It is the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. All this is happening at the cellular level. So what we take into our physical bodies is affecting the way we think and feel and laying the foundation for disease or disease by upsetting the biological terrain. And it is the biological terrain that support, that is, that both supports and is regulated by the systems of the body. So any disease that we have, do not look at it as in part, it is generally systemic, generally systemic. So now the cells of our body are going to have these needs and God creates tissue to provide all these needs. So unless we work on the root or the underlying causes of disease, we will simply it will simply manifest in a new form. Whenever one takes a drug to relieve a symptom or has some of their body parts cut out, you are not being healed. You know, healing doesn't come in that way or form. Healing comes to, to God's ideal and we must recognize that. Um, to be healed is to be made whole. That is to be restored to wholeness. So drugs and surgery, what they do is to chop off the branches. You know, the root cause of the problem remain and will grow suckers, what we call new diseases that will spring up in other places. So what we want to do is to establish the root by the definition that we gave in Ministry of Healing, page 127. What? The cause must be ascertained. We would have done this one already. So now, disease arise from the disharmony that results when one's constitution cannot adapt or cope with our environment. Disease is what we call a lack of ease. It develops as those stresses overwhelm the adaptive mechanism of the body. So let's break that down. God gave us an immune system. He gave us all the systems of the body to contribute to the health of the cell. But we have now those root causes that we talked about, what? Trauma, physical trauma, um, toxins or poisons, nutritional deficiency, and emotional stress. These things overwhelm the body and create a disharmony in the constitution so that the, the result is that we're having problems that the body is going to try to throw off. Disease is always a con combination of, listen to this, constitutional weakness interacting with environmental stresses. We said what the environmental stresses were, there are four of them. So constitutional weakness, remember we said the constitution is the soil in which you and I live in, which is our emotional and our physical makeup. So when we have constitutional weakness, which is we inherit from our ancestors, our parents, those two trees that combine to make this one tree, you and me, we inherit sometimes constitutional weaknesses. Remember we said what they were in terms of our glands, in terms of um, hydrochloric acid production, in terms of our liver. A lot of us have inherited that and we don't know. And so we all treat our bodies the same way because we, 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 we do diet in the family, 
we do lifestyle in the family, and so we get sick in the family. So the trunk of the, the tree is what we call the biological terrain. Um, the cells of the body live in that environment, and, and it is the composition of this fluid that determines the health of the cell. So remember we're talking about that the environment in which the cells live, if there is inadequate oxygen, inadequate nutrients, inadequate waste removal, or temperature is not regulated, they are going to have a problem. Bring that together with your physical trauma, your toxins, your nutritional deficiency, and your emotional stress. That's a cocktail for the, laying the foundation for disease. So just like the health of a plant depends on the health of the soil in which the plant grows, so the health of the cell, the tissues, depend on the composition of the body fluids, the lymph and the blood. So now when these are unbalanced, the whole organism is affected because this, this, this fluid is circulating all through the body. All right. So now cells need oxygen. So God created what? A respiratory system to provide the needs. Cells need nutrients. Then there is a digestive system to do that. Of course, the digestive system and the respiratory system doesn't only bring nutrients and oxygen. They are also part of the body's system to eliminate waste. Of course, now the circulatory system is going to contribute to the body. Remember, all these systems must work efficiently for the health of the cell. The circulatory system, which consists of the heart and the blood vessels and so on, is the transport system. Even though you have all the oxygen that is there, and all the nutrients are available, they must be transported. So God is going to create a system. What is God trying to teach us? Interdependence and how love work. The, the respiratory system does not hold back its oxygen. The digestive system doesn't hold back its nutrients. The, the, the factors that determine that are our understanding as to how they work and to give them the tools they need. We are the ones that hold them back by not giving them the tools they need. Our function in the whole thing as organism is to give the systems the tools they need to function the way God designed them to function. So now all the waste cannot be eliminated through the blood. And so God created what we call a back alley system, which is the lymphatic system, the environment in which the cells live that is that actually um, take care of a lot of the waste. So let's say for things like your plasma proteins, that can't get back into the bloodstream after they leave um, because there's no osmotic pressure there, they go through the lymphatic system. And God is so awesome that in the lymphatic system, you have these nodules that are like little sewage treatment plants. You know, they get rid of toxins before returning that fluid to the blood. God is truly an awesome God. We can be in awe. And of course, in terms of removing waste, you have the large intestine. That is the largest channel of elimination and the body's preferred channel of elimination. We are going to have the elimination of undigested food. And um, it's like a dumping ground for a lot of the debris from the lymphatic system. So when the colon cannot handle debris from the lymph, it is usually eliminated through the mucous membranes of um, lining the sinuses and lungs. And so this gives you an indication. When the colon is clogged, it cannot handle the stress that we put it under from our refined food diet and our poor lifestyles and our toxins and so on, emotional stress. A lot of people, if you, are, if you have congested thoughts and you don't have discharging of these, constipation is one of the results on an emotional level. And so when the body can't get rid of all these excess neurotransmitters and all these excess hormones and stuff, what do you think happens? It goes to the sinuses. Then there are your sometimes allergic reactions and your congestion in the in, in, in those in those areas. You know, um, there is a tightening of your chest, contributing to things like asthma. We're talking about cause. Remember, we are three dimensional. Then of course we have the urinary system. That's another important eliminating system. The kidneys are going to filter fluid from the blood for elimination. And of course, they are backed up by the sweat glands in the skin. And that acts as a kind of third kidney for eliminating waste from the blood. Now, remember, we are going to get symptoms when the body don't have enough energy to expel the toxins. That's when disease occurs. But if we have enough energy, this is going to happen without our even knowing. Then we have the skin that eliminates waste through the oil ducts. We have the liver 
that neutralizes toxins or change them into other chemicals, you know? We have temperature being regulated by the glandular system, and they are going to control how fast or how slow we burn food and heat. Um, then we have excess heat is going to be eliminated through the glands. And then we have muscles and bones and so on. God is an awesome God. And then, of course, besides the transportation and all these, we have a communication system, the nervous system, you know, that govern the entire community. We have the sense of hearing, of seeing, of taste, and they are extensions of the nervous system and allow the body to gather information from the outside world so we'll know how to act and think, you know. And then we have the structural system that allows the community to move because we have to go on to do, we have to, we have to demonstrate love, we have to find shelter. You know, so as imbalances in the biological terrain affect the structure and function of this system, you know, the branches of disease are going to be formed. Yeah, so treating symptoms is like what we call pruning a tree. That's what most people are doing. You, the pain that we feel is a symptom that something is wrong. The rash, the diarrhea, the vomiting, the nausea, the tumor, all these are symptoms. You know, people always, when we have forums like this, they say, how can I get rid of my pain? How can I get rid of my tumor? Now, that's not the best way. In other words, we need to go back and, and look at what is the cause. What is the problem that is causing this result? Because there is a paradigm in our education that says, let us get rid of the symptom. You remember, the symptom is the body talking, telling us that there is something out of balance. The real cure for disease is to get the body back into balance. So now removing disease symptoms by drugs or removing disease tissue with surgery is not eliminating the cause. It doesn't bring our biological terrain back into balance or restore the remove the normal function of the body systems. And of course, it does not strengthen the constitution. So let's do that again. When we try to eliminate or we suppressing symptoms by drugs or removing disease tissue by surgery, it does nothing to eliminate the cause. It does not bring the biological terrain back into balance. Remember the biological terrain is the environment in which the cells live and it does not return normal function to the body systems that have to make the contribution to health. And of course, it does not strengthen the constitution because it is the interaction of the constitution and the environmental stresses that bring on disease. Those are the main cause. Truly, God made the body right. The body is actually self-healing. If you get a cut, the body is going to heal itself. If you get a virus, the body is going to create so much mucus and heat in terms of fever to push it out. If you eat bad food, you are going to get some good diarrhea and some nausea. That's the body trying to push off the toxin. The diarrhea and the vomiting and the nausea are the body's, the body wanting to push off toxins. Even women, when you get pregnant or sometimes you're, you're, you have your period, you have PMS, the cramps. The body doesn't have enough energy so that the muscles can do the work of expelling that lining, that nest. If you get pregnant, the liver goes into high detox. And in high detox, the liver is going to be pushing a lot of toxins for elimination into the digestive system. And so you're going to get nausea or you're going to vomit because the body wants to push off the toxins to give the baby the best chance. But what do we do? We don't help the body. We want to now get rid of the symptom. As a matter of fact, if the body has enough energy, a lot of the symptoms we get, we wouldn't get them. The body will just deal with the whatever is stressing it. So there are some women, if you're really healthy, you don't get the morning sickness at all. Yeah, you don't get the morning sickness. And, and that is really possible. So every cell in our body is surrounded by this lymphatic fluid and it needs the fluid. For the cells to be healthy, the ocean of lymph must be free of toxic waste, comfortable warm, and have the proper balance of nutrients and oxygen. So the four root causes of disease are the end of environmental conditions, that disrupt the balance of the biological terrain. Um, we've been saying that and we'll see that all the time. The root causes of disease are the environmental conditions that disrupt the biological terrain. 
How does God put that in the scripture in the book of Corinthians? He says, evil communication corrupt good manners. So the root causes are the evil communication that disrupt good manners, the biological terrain. These disruptions create a cascading sequence of events that create the disease process. Now, remember we said that these disruptions, the disruption in the biological terrain brought about by the environmental conditions of trauma, physical trauma, of nutritional deficiency, toxins, and of course, emotional and mental stress. They are going to create a cascading sequence of events that create the disease process. So now you have disease being a process. Now there are four stages in the disease process now. So remember there are four environmental conditions that affect the biological terrain that is going to lead to disease. And then there are four stages in the disease process, each of which creates a different kind of imbalance in the biological terrain. Now, this is important to understand. So in the um, disease process, which there are four stages, call them one, two, three, and four if you'd like, each of them will create a different kind of imbalance because remember, the environmental conditions are creating an imbalance in the biological terrain, and hence the systems of the body are unable to make their contribution to the health of the cell. Right. So now we're going to go this over. I'm, I'm going to repeat it all the time so that you will be able to get it. Because when people think of disease, that is an enemy, that is a problem. What, this is, what is happening at the cellular level is that these environmental conditions, what are they again? Number one, physical trauma. Number two, toxins, whether they be environmental or otherwise. Then you have nutritional deficiencies from your diet and then, um, or even your environment. And then you have emotional stress um, in terms of your thoughts and your feelings. Those things are affecting the biological terrain, the environment in which the cells live, and they are creating different kinds of in, uh, imbalances based on the stage of disease. Most times when the stage of disease is picked up, it is, it is very late. So these are the four um, stages of disease and what we call the tissue states. We're talking here about chronic illness is really just an extension of acute illness and a precursor to degenerative disease. So let's say that again, chronic illness, you know, um, like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease and the like. We call them chronic because of the characteristics that they exhibit, but they are simply an extension of an acute situation. What is an acute situation then? Now, it is what we call like an irritation and infection or some kind of um, trauma. Irritation, infection, and trauma cause acute situations. Let me give an example. So let us say I overeat and I feel sick. I feel a burning in my stomach and all these things. Something has irritated the mucous membrane. But I love my food, so I continue to eat. I didn't take care of it. And then I start to get burning um, two days a week. Eventually, after several months, it burns me every time I eat. The acute situation is one that just happened. Now, the flat line on that graph represents normal health. Acute is the sign of what we call irritation. There is an irritation, something, some environmental condition, either nutritional deficiency or trauma or toxin or emotional stress. So for example, let's look at emotional stress. So because I'm stressed, work, work is stressed, family stress, financial stress, what stress does is to cut off your digestion. It, it inhibits digestion. If digestion is inhibited, then hydrochloric acid may not be produced as it should. It becomes weak. The enzymes don't function well. There is long retention time. Long retention time, low hydrochloric acid is going to lead to burning of the mucous membrane. You know, when that mucous membrane burns away, then it gets down to the muscle. And that is, the stomach is not designed, that, that, that kind of acid should not be on the muscle. That's why yeah, there's a mucous membrane. So there's irritation. What do we do? Do we reduce our stress or our trauma? No. We take an antacid to get rid of the burn. 
but the burning is actually saying something. So that would be like an acute. Eventually, if it's not checked, um, after a couple of years, you go to a test because the pain is so bad. First, it was burning, now it's burning and pain and other symptoms. And the doctor says you have an ulcer. That ulcer actually started by, by that irritation. So in the acute um, stage of disease, there is irritation of tissue. There is irritation of cells. That irritation does the same thing all the time. It is going to initiate inflammation. Irritation um, causes what we call chemical messengers of histamine and bradykinin to send to the brain some messages to say, please open up the blood vessels, make them more porous. We need some help here. That is where disease begins. Now, subacute stage, of course, if, if the acute situation is not remedied, by the way, it is in the acute state that you want to attack disease if it occurs. When it's not that you can't attack it at the other stages, but it becomes more difficult. Remember we said that there are different tissue states that are going to happen based on the stage of disease. The best time to attack is when there is, it starts. But because we have not learned how to read the body, the body's been irritated. When the body's been irritated and it speaks, we need to respond to the body, but we become irritated by the irritation. <laughs> and so we go to drugs or to surgery. Now in the subacute stage, there is stagnation. Why is there stagnation? We are going to see. And then of course, chronic over time, if stagnation continues, the system is going to be depressed. And if that continues unremedied, then you go to degenerative stage, what we call atrophies. There is what we call a breaking off from life, you know, from this side to another side. So medical research that even serious chronic or degenerative diseases have their root in chronic inflammation. Remember we said that inflammation is the body's initial response to irritation, tissue damage, or infection. Um, if if we, um, we know that and the heart disease begins with an inflammatory process, which sets the stage for hardening of the arteries. And that is so. So let's give an example. Um, we talked a lot about insulin early in the week. Now, if your insulin, your body becomes, your cells become resistant to your own insulin. What does that do? Now, insulin, one of the effects of insulin is that it affects the endothelial cells of the blood vessels. It cause them to be in a hyperactive state. Now, insulin is going to prevent them from absorbing nutrients. When they cannot get nutrients in, what do you think is going to happen? They are going to become damaged. And as they become um, damaged, the body is going to lay down cholesterol as an internal plaster. That is going to cause the blood vessels to narrow. When the blood vessels narrow, then the heart has to work harder. That's your high blood pressure. That's one way you can get high blood pressure. So we're saying here, that um, the inflammatory process is going to be likened to the acute stage of disease. The body is trying to say something to us. And when the arteries are hardened, that's chronic. But the inflammatory process started a long time ago. Um, so even the conditions that create cancer have their root in the inflammatory process. And we have an entire presentation on that. Inflammation is the first stage of disease and correspond to the tissue state we call irritation. So, or the acute state. So wherever you see inflammation, you go to the doctor, he says, you have full inflammation, especially women, a lot of women are, are on fire with inflammation. That's why they have the fibroids and the polycystic ovaries and so on. And it's a lot of times because of their diet and their thoughts, very important. So now when cells get damaged, they burst. I think I will skip this and we'll do that inflammation another time because this is this is this is this is really a powerful piece of the pie that that many people need to understand so cells are going to get damaged for varying reasons if you have high levels of glucose in the blood that can be damaging to cell high levels of environmental toxins high levels of hormones high levels of neurotransmitters like we said a lot of folks are under stress when you are under stress high levels of cortisol now, not just cortisol, but higher levels of insulin because you are going to have a high demand for glucose because to deal with stress, you need energy. So now insulin levels are going to be high. 
amylase levels are going to be high. When these are high in the body, the body have to break them down. The liver has to overwork. So there's a, a cascade of things that are happening at the cellular level, unbeknownst to us, that is designed to help us. But the body is going to become overwhelmed when we don't understand them. Now, it's the job of the lymphatic system to suck up the debris and clean up the area. If we activate the lymphatic system in any acute condition, the problem is going to be reversed. Remember we talked about the lymphatic system, the lymph being, as it were, the soil, the biological terrain. So its job is to, the debris that results from the irritation, the, it's going to get into the lymphatic system, and that is going to be cleaned up through those lymph nodes and glands that are like sewage treatment plants. If they are working well, then what's gonna happen is that we are going to reverse acute situations. So when you get a swollen gland, whether it's in the groin or in the neck or in the, the tonsils, that's the lymphatic system actually working. It's working to remove the cause of disease, but we may not know how to listen to them. So in the subacute stage, there's what we call stagnation. Now, stagnation is very important to understand why, because things start moving slowly in stagnation. So if we don't deal with the injury in the acute stage of inflammation properly, stagnation is going to set in because one of the things that happen is that um, stagnation is one of the body's attempt to prevent infection. So it's going to occur because albumin isn't the only plasma protein that leaves the circulatory system at the site of serious injury. Remember we talked about insulin, and insulin is going to cause damage to the endothelial cells in blood vessels. Now, now um, in the blood vessels, you have uh, plasma proteins that keep the blood from leaking out and minerals and stuff from just leaking out. Um, albumin, globulin, and fibrinogen. The smallest and most abundant is your albumin. Uh, that's the most active one. And then you have things like your globulins, which are important in immune response, and fibrinogen, which is in terms of your clotting. So now, one of the things when inflammation starts to happen is that it increases the permeability of the blood vessels. The, the pores are going to open up and cause leaking of these plasma proteins into the tissue spaces. Fibrinogen being involved in clotting is going to initiate clotting at that site. And there's going to be a slowing down of the circulation process. So those tissues now are not going to be getting the amount of oxygen and nutrients over time that they should, no waste removal. What that means is that the cells are going to start to swim in their own waste. Even if it, the, the, the blood supply brings in the oxygen and nutrients, the waste is not being removed fast enough. So they are going to start to swim in their own filth. They are going to start to die. That's what um, this, um, this is kind of describing here. So when fibrinogen penetrates the tissue spaces surrounded by weakened and injured cells, the conditions are present you know, for the fibrinogen to cluster and to clot. That's what fibrinogen does. Um, if the plasma proteins are allowed to remain in the tissue spaces too long, they will clump together and hold the fluid in the tissue. That's your swelling. You're talking here, that's your things like your, the result of arthritis when the knee and stuff and the joints swell up and they are hurting. Now, when they swell um, and the fluid is retained, this, the fluid is retained and the, the fibrinogen is doing its work, that retention of fluid is going to press against the nerves. And then that's what you will call your pain. Yeah, so the classic symptoms of inflammation are heat, swelling, redness, and pain. This is going to create what we call swampy conditions in the tissue um, and because the fluid is no longer able to move rapidly. Toxins are going to build up in the tissue spaces and there's going to further weaken or damage the cells. The heat dissipates as the cells tire because they, and they start to become underactive. They can't handle the pressure. At first, they are going to try, but they wouldn't be able to. With stagnation, we have entered the subacute stage of disease. And then, of course, we go to the chronic state of disease, which we call depression. So as, stagnation, as that stagnant pool persists, because remember, we move from acute stage where the thing just happened, the body's trying to fight. We go into the subacute stage where things are slowing down. 
Now we go into the chronic stage. So think your diabetes, your high blood pressure, your kidney disease, mm. right? There's actually a stagnant pool persisting in the body. The tissues continue to be starved of oxygen and nutrients because remember, healthy cells require oxygen, nutrients, waste removal, and regulated temperature. Healthy relationships require healthy people. When people are unhealthy, they cannot have healthy relationships. You know, that is how the enemy gets us because it is our relationship with one another that is going to glorify God. Think about your diabetic or your hypertensive who is impatient and anxious. Are they pleasing God? Then think about their loved ones who they are hurting. Your loved one is under stress. You are killing them in increments and then they are impatient with you. You, you, oh, the diabetic and the hypertensive, oh, I know I'm not supposed to eat this. And they are disobeying the laws of health, left, right, and center. How then can we say we are glorifying God? So healthy relationships require healthy people. That's one of the purposes of following healthy principles because healthy relationships require healthy people. Now, so in the, the chronic stage, what we call depression, they also become increasingly poisoned by their own metabolic waste. Because remember, from stagnation, things aren't moving. This causes them to become chronically underactive or weakened. This chronic state of disease, there is a lack of what we call tissue activity. So in diabetes, in hypertension, all these, there is little tissue activity. Now, cell activity in terms of oxygen uptake, nutrient uptake, and waste removal is occurring at a rate of 80 times per second. That is amazing. 80 times per second. That is the amount of times the average hummingbird flaps its wings. At that rate is what is necessary to maintain health. More than that, healthy cells operate at an electrical potential of 20 millivolts. That is what it takes for them to be healthy. Now, a person who has diabetes, their cells are operating down to like 15 or 12 millivolts. That is creating a problem and the cells are going to become underactive. So the tissues are said to be depressed because they will not re respond properly to normal stimuli. So that's why we said why, this is why the diabetic is not only physically ill, that person is also mentally and spiritually ill because they can't respond. So you are teaching them something and all of a sudden they start to get hungry. And the diabetic will say, listen, listen, I don't want to hear that, you know, I have to eat. My diabetes start to act up. Now, where is the patience? The first thing is that God is love. And the first thing that love is, is patient. Where is the patience? There is no self-control, the fruit of the spirit, the evidence of a spirit-filled life is patience. First, love. Love is patient, joy, peace, long suffering gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, and meekness. Do we not now see the connection to the cause of disease? When we don't understand it, we do many things. We take medication to get rid of the symptoms. The disease is not gone. We are still impatient. We are still lacking the joy. We are still unkind. We are still self-seeking. Then just think about the financial cost. All the costs that we have to spend on medication, to buy um, test strips and to buy insulin. These things are expensive. Where do we get the money from? You know, money that could have been gone to, to buy healthy food, you know, all these things. So um, the stage of disease can last for months or even years. That's the chronic stage. In the chronic stage of disease, we also can encounter what we call heat again in chronic. Remember we had heat before um, um, in the, in the uh, acute stage of disease, now we're having heat again. Now this heat is not overactivity of the cells. So in the first instance, there was overactivity of the cells in the acute stage. In the chronic stage, there's also overact, is, is not because of overactivity. It is the heat that one encounters in a compost pile. It is brought on by the action of infection um, and actually of death, you know. The weakened, Tissues are susceptible to the activity of microbes. And of course, this is going to create heat as they feed on weak and dying tissue. So in chronic illness, tissues are starting to die. Then of course, we have the degenerative stage or atrophy. 
So as the situation remains chronic and many people are living with chronic disease and many die prematurely, there is an eventual breakdown, not only of function, but of structure. Uh, this is the final stage of disease. Tissues become dry, you know, as fluid stops moving. Because remember, the tissues live in a, this, this, the, 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 they're supposed to be a fluid medium. So if things are not moving, then they're going to become dry. They lose their mo uh, mobility and their elasticity and become brittle and rigid. So just as tissues were generated through the process of life, it is what? The final stage of disease. The process of life giving that generation is going to break down. And of course, we have a lot of problems there. Death is the, 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 the result. So if we think of atrophy as the condition of a leaf after it has fallen, the leaf was there and then the leaf falls out. When the leaf was on the tree, it was nice and supple and flexible and green. And now because its life giving sustenance is affected, it is now brown and brittle. This is the condition of atrophy tissue. And that is the end result of chronic disease, which, is, which was continued in from subacute conditions, which was initiated by some acute situation. So there's good news. As long as there is life in the tissue, they have the capacity to regenerate. Modern systems do not always teach that. But as long as there is life in the tissue, that is why you will hear many people say every disease can be reversed. It just has to do with the skill of those who are operating and the commitment of those who are ill to cooperate with God's methods and to turn up the electricity enough so that the cells will get the, the energy that it needs. You know, so as long as there is some kind of health, there is capacity to regenerate, to overcome the process of breakdown and decay and to renew themselves. This is what the healing process is about, to supply the healing process is now to supply the right conditions so that the process of life, gener life can regenerate and repair damaged tissue. Remember, herbs don't heal, neither does drugs. What herbs do is give the body the right conditions so that it can restart the regeneration and repair process. That's what drugs don't do. So when the irritant overpowers the body's coping mechanism, we're talking about stagnation is what happens and we slip below there. There are two reasons why the body is um, unable to successfully mount the crisis. The crisis is where you have to go back to the acute situation and eliminate the toxin. Why is the body unable to mount a crisis? First, the body was too weak to resist the irritant or and mount an effective response. Um, remember we talked about turning up the electricity. Normal cells operate at 20 millivolts of electricity. When you have to heal from a disease, you have to go up to 50 millivolts. They have to have plenty more. Think about a cancer cell that is operating at five millivolts. How do you get it up to 50 millivolts you have to have a lot of electric minerals and phytonutrients, which come from powerful medicinal plants. So this is why building health is the foundation of prevent preventative healthcare. The stronger the body is, the more easily it will, it will what, deal with the irritant. We call this immunity and God has designed that. That's why we talked about the immune system before. A second reason the body may be unable to mount an effective disease crisis is that the crisis is suppressed by medication. When we start to see the symptoms, we take medication. Symptoms such as fever, runny nose, vomiting and nausea, diarrhea, coughing, sneezing, skin eruptions, are methods the body uses to flush irritants from the inflammatory reaction. So don't think of them as bad. We have to help the body to do that. Believing symptoms is often a matter of interfering with these natural responses. This is why drugs are usually given in small doses um, of substances that would be toxic in larger doses. So the poisons interfere with the natural body processes and results in the appearance of a cure. When we do this, the body isn't really cured and the problem is only suppressed to progressively become subacute chronic and degenerative disease. 
right? So these irritants are causing the inflammation reaction, if inflammatory reaction. And the stomach and intestines, so the irritants cause the inflammatory reaction. What is the inflammatory reaction? The body increasing the, the bringing in of nutrients, opening up the capillary pores, and plasma proteins getting into the tissue spaces. That's the body trying to deal with it to get it out. But when it overwhelms the body, here's what's going to happen. Now, the stomach and the intestines are going to respond by the overactivity. Recognizing that an irritant is present, the body begins to generate symptoms and it starts with nausea. You know, nausea is an attempt of the digestive system to reverse the normal peristalsis so that food moves upward instead of downward in the digestive tract. The nausea is going to grow stronger and stronger as the body tries to gather energy to move towards the crisis. What is the crisis? To expel the toxin. It is the nausea that is moving the body to expel the toxin. If the nausea does not happen, then you, the toxin would not expel. It is simply the body's attempt to gather energy to expel, you know? Um, just the moment when the symptoms become worse, what happens? As the, the worse the symptom become, you're going to now throw up what we call vomit. Um, that's the body trying to heal itself. So now the symptom of nausea and vomiting are actually efforts of the body to expel what was irritating it. And they are actually functions of the immune system working in the body. You know, so when you get the flu um, and you, you get all that congestion, uh, you get, um, you get uh, the nasal congestion, and, you know, the stuffiness and stuff, the body is actually trying to expel the toxins. We have to help the body. We need some good decongestant, you know, and expectorant herbs in that situation, right? So when the body fails to eliminate the irritant, if it has, it doesn't have enough strength, or we suppress the crisis during, with medication, the irritant is still present in the body. At some point, the person may decide to improve their health, and when they try to do so, um, then they enhance their health, they have no energy, the body is now going to be stronger. And sometimes when you do that, when you start to improve your health, you kind of get back the disease again. Yeah, that may happen sometimes. The body now is going to go through the disease process in what we call in reverse. Right? So if the person started the healing process when the body was in the degenerative or the atrophic state, then the tissues will move through the chronic and subacute stage of disease until they are strong enough to attempt to expel the irritant again. Remember, expel, expulsion of irritant happens only in the acute stage. So now, but symptoms are going to happen more in the subacute and chronic states of disease. If the process of getting rid of these irritants is gradual, the symptoms um, of the reversal may be mild. But sometimes, however, the body will recreate the original acute symptoms. This phenomenon is known as the healing crisis. And the healing crisis is the result, now listen to this, is the result of the reversal process the body goes through as it heals from chronic or degenerative disease. That's important to understand. The healing crisis is the result of the reversal process the body goes through as it tries to heal from chronic or degenerative disease and not simply the result of doing a cleanse. That is not so. So this is how the healing crisis is going to look. Whether even if you're in um, degenerative situation or chronic situation, the body is going to move back up through the tissue states as it tries to heal. And in doing so, a crisis is recreated. So now, according to Herring's law of cure, the reversal process in natural healing um, was laid down by this guy, and it states that all cures come from within, out, from the head down, and in the reverse order as the symptoms have appeared in the body. Um, and so it says there's some truth to that. As the body pushes towards the disease crisis, you are going to feel worse. However, however, when it comes to dealing with chronic and degenerative disease, that is not true. That a lot of people say, oh, you're going to feel worse. It gets worse before it gets better. Now, since the person must increase the energy level 
to the point that they are able to initiate the healing crisis, they will always feel um, better before they feel worse. So if you're going through a healing program and you start to feel worse when you start, then that's another healing crisis. When you adding, when you start to give the body the energy it needs, the tools, you're going to start to feel better and then you may feel a little worse. So let's go ahead. So now there are four um, distinguishing characteristics of a healing crisis. Now listen to them carefully. A healing crisis is going to occur only when a person in a chronic or degenerated disease um, state is put on a health building program. Does not occur when a person is put on a cleanse. Repeat that. So if you go on a cleanse and you start to feel worse, not healing crisis because everything is operated according to law. Symptoms that occur during a cleanse are the result of the cleanse. And if they are severe, they, they are a sign that the person is cleansing too fast. So many people, especially if you use things like your cascara sagrada and your senna by themselves, you are going to cleanse too fast. Since the person's energy is being restored, and that's what you do when you are doing a nourishing situation because you're giving more energy, the person will always start to feel better because they are having more energy before the crisis occurs. A healing crisis also always involves symptoms of an acute illness that was not fully resolved. So it's something that you would have felt before. That is a healing crisis always involves an attempt in the body to recreate a suppressed or failed disease crisis. It involves symptoms of discharge, such as sinus congestion, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, skin rashes, fever, and headache. So, but you feel better first when you go on a program. Then these things might happen. Now, what a lot of people do is that when these things start to happen, if they go into a crisis, they stop because they become afraid. But listen to the good news. A healing crisis is generally short-lived, lasting typically 24 to 72 hours. So if you're having a healing crisis one week, two weeks, then you need to be very concerned. It's usually short-lived because you're giving the body the energy that it actually needs to fight the disease because we want the cells to be healthy. Enough oxygen, enough nutrients, waste removal and regulated temperature. We want that to happen. And how do you do this? Of course, you can do um, based on what it is. If you're in the acute stage, then of course, a cleanse will be important, but you want to have it mild. We need to be um, cleanse the life. Remember we said of those toxic thoughts and feelings, the life needs to be cleansed. Um, reduce our exposure to toxins. You may have toxic situations in your, in your you, you know, uh, all may not be able to be resolved immediately because sometimes you can't jump out of your home, but it's important to cleanse the life of toxins. Then of course you use diet, fasting and hydrotherapy. Those are very useful for cleansing our bodies. We need to let go of the past and forgive each other. We need to cleanse the soul. That's the cleansing of the thought. Forgiveness is very important in the healing process, especially of chronic disease. Now, one of the things I've found is that most chronic disease have emotional connection. Remember we talk about people of high blood pressure. They tend to have a lot of things bottled up. They keep things in and constipation. People with diabetes tend to be missing sweet in their lives and so on. People with heart disease, they have a problem with love. So there are emotional and as well as physical connotations to disease. It's not simply a physical thing. So we need to look at that. Um, detoxification is important because when we have chronic illness, the liver goes into high detox mode, but it doesn't have the tools. So a lot of toxins keep circulating in the blood. So detoxification is important. That's a big thing now. Um, we have two types. Uh, the detoxification occurs at two, two levels. We have tissue detoxification um, that takes place internally and involves the cells of the body, you know, especially the liver cells and the lymphatic system. Why? It is the lymphatic system that is going to have a lot of the toxins. That's the biological terrain, the soil. So we need to get that moving and get it to the liver so the liver can actually do its work of detoxification. Remember there are um, three main um, detox pathways in the liver. The liver has two phases of detoxification. You have glutathione conjugation, methylation, and sulfation. Um, glutathione conjugation is going to remove your environmental toxins and your heavy metals. 
Methylation is going to remove your neurotransmitters um, and your excess uh, hormones. And then sulfation, your environmental toxins and your heavy metals. So those things are important to get them um, working. So you want to remove the toxins from the cells. And then, of course, you have the external detoxification, getting the toxins out of the body. So it's not sufficient to get them out of the body. A detox is a very deep thing and must go through a process. You can't have a detox in one day. All right. So there are two approaches that we look at. We use herbs. One is um, a we call stimulating elimination. And we use that primarily in acute situations. And you have to know when to use what in acute situations where you use herbs and therapies to stimulate el elimination. They are generally used for short periods and not for long term use. They use up a lot of energy and nutrient reserve, and that can weaken the body if they're overdone. So you're going to use this only in acute when the things start. If it's chronic, you don't want to do that. And a lot of people make the mistake of going through using these cleanses when they're in a chronic situation. So they actually weaken the body more. They don't get better. And then they say, oh, the thing doesn't work. Then they, do, they lose trust in a good system through people who do not understand how to apply. All right. In a nourishing elimination, it relies on what we call nutrients to build up the body the body's energy and nutrient reserve in chronic toxicity. So in the, when you have chronic situations, you are going to not want to build. That is why you don't use a cleanse. So you don't want to use something that is causing heavy elimination. You're going to be losing nutrients and you're going to be um, using a lot of moisture. And that now is going to create what? A weakness in the body. It wouldn't have enough energy. As the body's energy increases, elimination begin to improve. Because remember, it is the body's energy that is going to push toxins off. It is usually slower, but much more lasting in its results. And it's used for a longer period of time. I want to pause here this evening because I believe that you have now a much better understanding of the, of the true cause of disease. We're talking here about the environmental factors that affect the environment in which the cells live. This is why people don't get results when they use drugs and so on, because the drugs do nothing to remove the environmental conditions, nor to remedy the biological terrain. But God has given us these methods. And as we continue in our program, many of them you are going to be studying to get a better handle because God wants us to thrive. He wants us to live. God does not want us to die. He is the author and the giver of life. This evening, I am challenging each one of us let us embrace life because God has given us a special work to proclaim the messages to the world of a loving savior who is the life giver, who is the life sustainer, who is a redeemer, who is love, and who in whom, through whom, we must demonstrate that love to the world. So may God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. I'm going to turn you back over to our host. Thank you, Brother Bob, for such a wonderful and informative presentation. It's always a blessing Man. to hear how you are, you know, informing and teaching the people of God how to live in these last days. We have a few hands. Let us take them quickly as we are past our time. So the first hand is, uh, have a one second for me. Eva Dean, please go ahead. Eva Dean, you're on mute. Please go ahead. Our brother Doc, uh, let us go on to Augustine Wilkes. Augustine Wilkes, please go ahead. Brother Bob, I have a lot of shy people this evening. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just go on ahead. Um, Dale Vassell, go ahead, please. Yes, you can unmute and speak. Uh, go ahead. Del Vassell. All right, let's move on. Melissa Wis Wisdom Douglas. Go ahead, Sister Douglas, unmute. Yes, hello. Yes, hello, good evening. Go ahead, sis, yeah. we are hearing you. Yeah, I think I have a question. 
You have to speak up. We can't hear you. No, I was saying I didn't have a question. Oh, you didn't oh. have a question. Okay, no problem. That's fine. That's fine. All right, let's go on ahead. Um, K English. Go ahead, K English. Please go ahead. Okay, she also took down back her hand. Mm, okay. All right, well, we have uh, Duar. Go ahead, Duar. Oh, yeah. I know this, this one was a heavy one. <laughs> uh, we can go and, and look at the presentation again. And All right, no problem. Well, let us turn to the questions in the Q and A then. Yes. That's All right. What are some of the herbs used to reverse the cold and the flu? Two. That's by Althea. Say that That's again. Not. What are some of the herbs that is used to reverse the cold and flu? The cold, the cold. The, well, the cold and the flu. What you want to do is some nice stimulating herb. You have things like your garlic and your onion, your cayenne, your lemon, ginger. Um, you can make some nice concoctions with that. So for example, um, I've noticed if the first symptoms of the flu, you start to feel it. I'm talking about the first, first, first. Now, vitamin C is a powerful thing. Um, normally, a person can take about a thousand um, units of vitamin C without any uh, negative impact. When this cold and the flu starts to come on, you can sometimes tolerate up to 10,000. So what I've found is that if you squeeze the juice of about five lemons or limes, and we have a lot of those in the Caribbean, and you drink it, just throw it in the back of your throat and you drink it, in less than half an hour, those symptoms are going to be gone. I've used it myself, but you must be very strong to drink it with a test <laughs> because it is strong, but you must take it when, it's, when you feel the first symptoms. You have other things, you can have hot ginger tea. You could do onion, garlic, cayenne, ginger, and some honey and lemon juice. That can be done. There are many things. Hydrate, drink a lot of fluid, rest. Don't forget the eight laws of health. Very, very important in reversing the flu. Open your windows, get some fresh air. Open up the airway. Um, if you find you are very congested, peppermint is a very good thing for opening up the airway. So based on the symptoms you have, there are various things you could do and based on what stage it is. What you don't want to do is to let it go to the subacute stage. You have to attack it in the acute stage. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Bob. And another question. Can you repeat when to use the cleanse in a chronic situation? Right, so you don't use the cleanse in a chronic situation. You want to nourish in a chronic situation. The cleanse is in an acute situation. So what you do is something you call a nourishing, you call it a, not a cleanse, but a nourishing cleanse. In other words, you are building the body, giving it the tools, and it will cleanse itself in a nice, even process, and you will not get a lot of the negative symptoms. So for example, herbs like alfalfa and these things, they are, com they are combinations. Uh, this is not the forum to do that. I always encourage people, get your consultation, let's know where people are, and then something will be designed for you and your situation. But you want to have things that give you a lot of nourishment. So um, people may do like a lot of vegetables, especially your green vegetables and so on. Very, very helpful. Broccoli. Right, thank you, Brother Bob. We have one last hand. Let's see if this person will actually speak. Okay, Cheyenne, E, go ahead. Cheyenne. Um, hello? Yes, go ahead, Cheyenne. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'm not. Okay, so um, on the slide that says, I think it's basic. I can't remember. You mentioned a Bible verse that I wanted to catch. Second Corinthians something, something. Second Corinthians 10, three to five. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, that's a powerful passage. Um, it gives us where the warfare is. is. Um, a lot of folks use it um, because it talks about strongholds, but it tells us what the strongholds are. The strongholds are our mind, our thoughts and our feelings that are against the principles of the kingdom of God. And um, because it talks about bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So Jesus came at the revelation of God to bring what truth really looks like and how truth works. And as we study the life of Christ, that is going to destroy all the arguments and pretensions that are in the world that is creating the chaos. It is actually going to be light eliminating the darkness. Okay, that was our last hand and our last question, Brother Bob. Uh, great. Please, please close out with prayer for us. All right, so let's pray. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, thank you again for the privilege of sharing what you want is for people to be so educated because we have to stand in the king's palace and to give a reason for our faith. And so because the world is scientific, you have called us because you are the designer of science. Open our minds to comprehend. More than that, to get the sense and to do. We pray that you will keep us even as we go to sleep this evening. May we have peaceful rest, knowing that as we are consistent, we are going to learn more and more. 